Every city has many layers. Under its roofs and buildings, the passions, stories, and secrets of its inhabitants move undetected. In the city we're visiting today, you can peel back another layer and look under the surface. You will discover a parallel city, a labyrinth of galleries, chambers, pits, and underground lakes unique in all of Europe. On today's Geographics, we're going to explore the Catacombs of Paris, one of the most unique attractions in one of the most unique cities in the world. So join me today as we dive into a maze of darkness beneath the City of Lights. We're going to find out about how the Catacombs developed, what are its dark secrets, and what are the habits of its peculiar inhabitants. First of all, a distinction. Today I'm going to use the word catacombs to refer to the entirety of the vast network of galleries that sprawls underneath Paris, a reign of darkness underneath the City of Lights. But if we really want to be picky, the tourist attraction known as the catacombs consists of only two kilometers of tunnels that are open to the public, which were used as a burial place in the 18th and 19th centuries. This is just a tiny fraction of the whole network, which extends to a total of up to 200 miles. Today it is largely closed the general public for most of the year. But a good Parisian is always a bit of a revolutionary, and so organized a group of explorers who defy law by roaming the dark corridors that are normally off limits. The development of this parallel city below the surface it started very early. Experts evaluated that quarry tunnels have existed on the outskirts of Paris since Roman times. The limestone in these quarries built much of Paris since ancient times. Little by little, builders started mining underneath Paris, a clever idea to save time and the costs of transportation of limestone from elsewhere. In medieval times, the building frenzy extended to religious buildings. Paris's Cathedral of Notre Dame was built with stone carved from these mines. Now, I'm not a civil engineer, but I can guess that digging big holes under street level is going to create some kind of problem at some point. Surprisingly, though, it took several centuries before the first major collapse occurred, and that happened in December of 1774. One of the tunnels connecting the mines crumbled, opening a gaping hole that swallowed houses and people on the Avenue de more disasters occurred over the next few years, and finally the king he took action. Louis XVI commissioned an architect named Charles Axel Guillemot to explore, map, and stabilize the quarries. The individual mines were unconnected to each other at this stage. It was Guillemot's inspectors who dug more tunnels connecting the isolated networks and creating today's layout. Work went on until 1780, when what must have been one of the most morbid events ever took place. Since 1763, a royal edict had banned all burials in the capital for sanitary reasons. The church opposed the order, and nothing was done. So back to 1780. An unusually long period of spring rain caused a wall around Le Innocent to collapse. Le Innocent was Paris's largest cemetery. This resulted in a literal avalanche of rotting corpses and pestilent sludge crumbling into the neighboring properties. Church officials agreed to do something about it, and the king ordered Guillemot to find a solution. And voila, the architect relocated thousands of bodies and bones into the quarry tunnels, which effectively became the catacombs. A distinctive feature of these catacombs is the Denfer Richero Ossery, the tourist site that you can visit. Initially, the bones of the dead were first stored very simply. Only later, the funeral workers began arranging the bones in decorative structures such as hearts or circles. Even the walls and pillars were lined with skulls, tibias, fibulas. It feels sort of like walking into the stomach of a huge monster. Above the entrance, an inscription was placed in something in French, which I'm not going to try and pronounce, but in English it says, Stop! This is the Empire of Death. One of the most famous structures is the barrel. It is a barrel-shaped pillar assembled with thousands of bones, which was erected to support the ceiling of the room called the Crypt of the Passion, a job it does incredibly well. The catacombs ended up providing eternal rest to six to seven million dead Parisians. Among them, several victims of the French Revolution and some notables who fell under the guilt like Maximilien de Robespierre. Another celebrity whose bones can be found here is the 17th century writer Charles Perrault, author of Little Red Riding Hood and Cinderella. The extended network of the catacombs played a role also during the Paris Commune. During the last months of the Franco-Prussian War, a socialist insurgency established an autonomous government in the City of Lights. The insurgents had to face the violent repression of the rival French Third Republic, established after Napoleon III's abdication. An English conservative journalist in Paris described how 6,000 of the defeated insurgents were seeking refuge underground. He wrote, Wandering in an agony of despair in the labyrinth of the catacombs. 
It seems like every time Paris went through a period of unrest, the catacombs they came in handy. During the Second World War, for example, the underground city was bustling with activity. First, the German Luftwaffe established their bunker, then the collaborationist government, and finally the head of the resistance built their underground headquarters here. These three hideouts are easily connected to each other, and that is why rumor has it that members of the three factions would often bump into one another in the dark galleries and simply ignore each other for one reason or another. But this fun bit of history is not actually true. The bunker was never in use at the same time. This is one of the many urban legends about the catacombs, and we've got plenty more of those coming up later. Entering the quarries became illegal in 1955, not so much as a form to control illicit activities, but to prevent accidents and people getting lost in the 200 miles of tunnels. But when strife came, the Parisians would always know how to make good use of the galleries. In 1968, a student protest erupted into riots, pitting Parisian students against riot squads. The catacombs proved handy, and the students in revolt used used these galleries to evade the police and quickly reassemble in other parts of the city. In later decades, mostly the 1970s and 1980s, a new movement blossomed, the cataphiles, the catacomb enthusiasts. The traditional Parisian rebelliousness got a fresh kick from punk culture. Taking advantage of the many entrances still open, groups of young cataphiles discovered that they could descend into the quarries from the basements of their schools. In secret places only they knew how to reach, the cataphiles partied, staged performances, created art, and took drugs. At first, the world on the surface barely took notice, but by the end of the 1980s, the city and private property owners had shut down most of the entrances, and an elite police unit began patrolling the tunnels. The cataphiles may have dwindled in numbers, but they're still very active. Their main activities are the exploration and preservation of the ancient galleries, but they sometimes like to party hard as well. They certainly know how to tease the public. One of them, photographer Patrick Alk, said in an interview, You guys have no idea what's down there. It is natural that the catacombs exert a powerful influence on popular culture. This has given rise to many urban legends, including tales of secret meetings, satanic rites, neo-Nazi gatherings, and even ghosts. If you happen to visit one of the underground burial sites after midnight, don't, there's a hefty fine, but if you do, legend says you will hear the walls begin to speak. People say that it's the voices of the dead urging you to move deeper and deeper into the catacombs until you'll never find your way out. Indeed, this may actually have happened to a man named Philibert Aspierre during the French Revolution. He was a doorman at the Val de Gras hospital. On an errand to fetch a certain liquor from a cellar, Philibert somehow entered the catacombs instead. Walking around the pitch black with just a single candle, Philibert must have become lost and confused. Maybe he was intoxicated, or maybe it was the voices dragging him deeper into the underground city. His body was found 11 years later by a group of early cataphiles. They identified him by the hospital keyring on his belt. Aspierre was buried on the very spot that he had died, and tombstone commemorates his story. Catavars today say that each November the 3rd, Philibert's ghost haunts the labyrinth of the catacombs. There are also persistent rumors of occult groups sneaking underground to perform satanic rituals. In our research, however, we found little actual clues of the devil's minions at work. There are two unnerving sets of graffiti scrawled in red under the boulevard Arago, and they read, Aria Satan or Stand Back Satan. And there is also a story told by Gilles Thomas, France's most prolific catacomb expert and author. In the 18th century, a man called César hustled Parisians into paying good money to go underground and meet the Prince of Darkness himself. Deep into the catacombs, he chanted mystical incantations, to which his accomplices made some dogs bark and then lit some firecrackers. Apparently, this guy was eventually arrested and died in an underground cell at the Bastille. Tomas tells yet another disturbing story. In 1896, early explorers of the tunnels came across a pile of hundreds of small skulls. These had nothing to do with the official ossuary. These skulls belonged to small creatures. But why were they there? Could they be the remains of years of sacrificial rites and occult ceremonies? Two naturalists decided to investigate. They quickly established that all the skulls belonged to cats. They then found out that the pile of remains was just below the chute of a well. When they climbed upstairs, they found a surprise. The entrance to the well was in the courtyard of a chic restaurant renowned for its rabbit dishes. So here, Satan didn't have a part in it. It was just a dishonest cook. Another group of cataphiles reported a strange finding in the early 1990s. While walking through the arsery, they happened upon a video camera on the ground. To their surprise, the camera had footage on it. As the group watched the footage, they heard some disturbing noises. It became clear that the man holding the video camera was lost, and he had no idea how to escape. The cataphiles reported that it appeared as though the man was going mad inside the dark maze. The video ends abruptly, with the camera dropping on the ground. To this day, no one knows who this man was, or if he ever made it out alive. 
My take on this, I'm a little bit skeptical. These guys say they found the camera in the ossuary. This means that the mysterious cameraman got lost in a well-known, well-mapped, well-lit, well-guarded tourist spot. Later, in 1990, TF1, French Public TV, ran a report showing an underground rally of a neo-Nazi group busy singing fascist war songs and clashing with a similarly violent far-left group. The reporters also showed footage of a black mass taking place, robes and candles and all. Newspaper La Liberation exposed it all as a hoax, though. The whole report had been staged with the help of actors and extras. There had been a neo-Nazi scare when a group of underground taggers identified themselves as La Gestapo de Ons, Gestapo of the Waves, but they had no Nazi affiliation were just that, taggers. But TF1 had capitalized on the story and created some rather fun fake news. So, so far it's all rumors and tall tales, but weird stuff does happen down in the catacombs. In 2004, Parisian police were assigned to do a training exercise in a previously uncharted part of the catacombs. Entering the catacombs through a drain, officers first came across a sign that read, Building Site No Access, and a bit further in, a camera that actively recorded images of those that passed. As the officers approached the camera, barking dogs could be heard. But it turns out this was just a security system. It was a recording of dogs barking that was triggered by motion sensors next to the camera. The police went deeper and discovered a 500 square meter cavern with a fully equipped cinema. It had a giant screen, projector, chairs, and a handful of film noir classics and more recent thrillers. In the next room, police discovered a fully stocked bar and a restaurant complete with tables and chairs. All of this was serviced by electric and phone lines that were professionally installed. The police, they were baffled. Three days later, they returned with experts from the French Board of Electricity to try and figure out where the power was coming from. The cables by then had been cut, and a note was lying on the floor that read, Do not try to find us. The mystery is still unsolved to this day. Was it the underground pleasure palace of a super criminal or simply the business venture of some tax dodger? Speaking of underground hideouts for picturesque criminals, if you are familiar with the novel The Phantom of the Opera and its adaptations, you will remember the disfigured protagonist Eric rowing on an underground lake. Well, the lake exists, and it's in the catacombs. Located underneath the Opera Garnier Theatre, it measures 60 yards long and 12 feet deep. As the foundation for the theatre was laid in the 1860s, engineers struggling to drain water from the sodden earth ended up simply pumping it into the reservoir. This underground pond is not home to a vengeful musician, though, but to several well-fed fish. The lake is not universally known, but opera employees are well aware of it and feed its fauna with a nice diet of mussels. The lake is also used by firefighters who use it to practice underwater rescues in a dark environment. From what we've explored so far, you might guess that the Catafile community is very active and varied despite the constant threat of being fined upwards of 60 euros or even being arrested. The police force looking after the catacombs has been nicknamed the Cataflix flick being a slang term for a police officer. The cataflicks are mainly concerned with issues of health and safety. Even an experienced cataphile is still at risk of ending up buried under a landslide, falling into a pit, or just getting lost. In 2011, three young explorers lost their way and roamed through the galleries for two whole days before an officer finally found them. However, most cataphiles are undeterred and dedicate themselves to a variety of pursuits. The basic cataphile is generally somebody who's looking to escape from the bustle of Paris to retreat into a parallel city where the temperature is cool in the summer and mild in the winter, where Wi-Fi and 4G cannot reach you, and where you can simply explore at will in solitude. Some of them even organize camping trips for days or even weeks. According to the police, it's not uncommon for lovers to have their romantic encounters in the catacombs. And then you have the groups of party animals who organize secret raves with DJs and all dancing in the underbelly of the City of Lights. The catabolies once disrupted a party of more than 300 ravers. The most famous amongst these parties is the annual celebration of Cataloween. In essence, it's essentially a regular Halloween party, but the location does create something of an unusual atmosphere. Hedonists, anarchists, and the odd tourists alike descend into the underworld for a different kind of trick or treat. Most of the activities, though, are of a cultural nature. Theatre groups organize secret shows and concerts. There's also suppers by candlelight, art exhibitions, and even swimming across the frequent subterranean pools. Most of the cataphiles are, in fact, dedicated to mapping, preserving, or improving the state of the catacombs. And they don't approve of exploiting this heritage for raucous parties. What happens when the party's over? Who's going to pick up the litter? Well, actually, that's where the catacleans enter the picture. These are individuals with a conscience and a lot of patience who roam the catacombs, picking up the mess of their ruder counterparts. In their weekends long expedition, they can collect up to a metric ton of trash. But the most surprising underground activity we found out about involves mushrooms. Not the type you would get at a rave, nope, the actual mushrooms that you can eat. It turns out that since the 19th century, 
Prairie Parisians and non-Parisians alike have been growing perfectly fine mushrooms in the catacombs. It all started with a gentleman called de Chambry. While exploring the galleries, he came across young mushrooms happily growing underground. And so he got the idea to use the abandoned tunnels to cultivate his own. More imitators followed, and very soon this practice was accepted and regulated by the French National Society of Horticulture. People came from all over France to the catacombs and grew their own mushrooms. This practice soon became a successful and profitable enterprise. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video and that we succeeded in making you just a little bit curious about visiting this fascinating location. As I mentioned, the part that's open to the public is limited to the main ossuary. You'll also find a link to the official site in the description below. There are even some guided tours which offer access to restricted areas, and that link is also below. If you want to go full catafile though, well, in that case, I'm afraid I can't help you. But there are some forums out there where you can find out information about exclusive rendezvous of mole people, or even directions to the secret entrances. One thing I learned from these forums is that you must never, never go alone, especially if it's your first time. If you really can't resist the lure of the uncharted galleries, make sure you notify a friend or family member and tell them the entrance that you took and the general direction of your trip. Bring plenty of food, water, waterproof clothing, and a torch with spare batteries, and most importantly, a bottle of good wine to go along with those mushrooms. So like I said, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you next time.